everyone. This is Josh Mendelson. If you could please take your seats, please. Kim, if you could go ahead, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's see if I'm good. I think I am. All right. Thank you. Um, welcome to the FCC. I'm Kim Charlson, co-chair of the Disability Advisory Committee for the Federal Communications Commission. I want to welcome everyone. I hope you had safe travels, whether they were short or distance. Um, to today's meeting. So we're going to have introductions um, over the next 30 minutes, and we're going to start with official welcoming from um, the chairwoman of the FCC, Jessica, where's it? Oh, I lost her name. Excuse me. Um, and she will, um, she will welcome us to today's meeting. And it's a pre recorded message. So. Good morning, and welcome to the first Disability Advisory Committee meeting of 2024. It's January for about 39 more hours, I checked. So <laughs> I am still allowed, I think, to wish everyone a happy new year. I want to thank you for joining us today, including everyone who is online. I'm traveling right now, so I can't join you in person. But I did want to take the time to thank you for volunteering your time to be a part of this important committee. Special thanks to your co-chairs, Kim Charlson and Kyle Dixon for leading this meeting and leading this committee. Thank you also to Susie Rosen Singleton and the outstanding team we have in our Disabilities Rights Office who support this committee. Now we last gathered here nearly five months ago and since then we've advanced a whole bunch of reforms and you helped make them happen. This is good stuff, so let me do a little bit of a review and recap. In October, we expanded the availability of audio description, which inserts narrated descriptions of a program's key visual elements into natural pauses and dialogue to help individuals who are blind and visually impaired enjoy video programming. At the time, the Commission's rules required video programmers to offer audio description in the 100 largest TV markets by the end of this year. We voted to phase in audio description requirements for an additional 10 markets yearly until all markets are covered nationwide, 100%. Then at our December open meeting, we voted to make smartphones more accessible to consumers with hearing loss. We adopted a proposal tentatively concluding that a 100% hearing aid compatibility requirement for wireless handset models is an achievable goal, and we proposed a timeline for making this happen. Make no mistake, taking this important step would not have been possible without the efforts of many of you to reach consensus on this important goal. So big thank you. And it's also worth noting that we've taken other actions to promote accessible communications as part of proceedings that may not seem related to disabilities access on the surface. In November, we adopted rules to implement a law called the Safe Connections Act. Now this law was adopted to help domestic violence survivors access safe and affordable connections. Our provisions to help survivors separate service lines from accounts that include their abusers make clear that a covered wireless service provider has to make accommodations for individuals with disabilities. Again, we're striving to make sure this law and the policies we adopted for it work for 100% of us. One other area where accessibility is front of mind is artificial intelligence. We've launched an effort to see how AI tools can be used to prevent unwanted robocalls and robotexts. We're specifically looking at how AI technologies can help users of relay services 
get the automated messages they want and help block them from getting the ones they don't want. Now, we'd love to have your feedback on this subject because while we're in the early days of this technology, we know from history that bringing your equities on board at the start is absolutely vital. So we not only want to get your best ideas, we also are going to be looking to you to help spread the word about an important change that's on the horizon. All right, let me explain. You and your allies have helped so many people know about the Commission's Affordable Connectivity Program, or ACP. The ACP provides monthly discounts to low-income households struggling to pay for broadband service. And thanks in part to your efforts, more than 23 million households have enrolled in this historic effort to promote broadband affordability. As of right now, Congress has yet to provide additional funding to extend the program, so we have to take steps to start winding it down. In fact, no new ACP enrollments will be accepted after February 7th, and benefits are expected to continue until ACP funding runs out, which we project will happen sometime in April of 2024. If you look at your calendar, that is just three months from now. So please know that the FCC is working hard to engage with the disability community to maximize awareness, and we really appreciate your efforts to reach out to your organization's members as well. Shifting to the agenda for today's meeting, one of the highlights will be a discussion of how accessible emergency communications works and how callers with disabilities can reach 988 and 911 to get the help they need. Direct video calling to 988 for users of American Sign Language is now available, as well as text to 988. And we, of course, we look forward to the day that NG911 is fully deployed so that 911 callers everywhere can use text, data, and video, and voice all on the same call. Like I said up front, we want our communications efforts to reach 100% of us, those with disabilities included. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And thank you to everyone for all the work you do on this committee. Thank you. Um, what a great opening. I think, is my mic still on? Just getting used to the system. Okay, thank you. All right. Those were great remarks from the chairwoman and really appreciate it. We also have a welcome from Commissioner Symington, and that's also a pre recorded message. So we will hear from him now. Thank you to Josh Mendelson for the kind invitation to speak at this meeting of the Disability Advisory Committee. I'm very much looking forward to reviewing today's proceedings, but today I would like to float a trial balloon on a related but somewhat different topic to those being discussed today, direct video calling. As most of you already know, direct video calling is a service akin to video relay service. It allows users of American Sign Language to video call ASL fluent customer service agents directly to discuss customer service related issues or users of government services rather than customers as the case may be. ASL fluent CSAs receive direct video calls from the ASL community, much as non-ASL speaking CSAs might re receive a relayed video call through a BRS service. Many businesses and governments rely on BRS as a vital service for serving deaf and hard of hearing ASL users, and there's no reason to think that that should or indeed can change. But some companies and governments are also beginning to use direct video calling as a substitute, and the reactions from both ASL users and the firms themselves has been positive. And why not? A relay service is exactly that, including a third person as a relay in an otherwise one-to-one -one conversation, whereas direct video calling is precisely that. Direct. Naturally, we might anticipate some gains in efficiency or understanding when a conversation is direct rather than relayed. Don't get me wrong, though. This isn't a solution that is right for every organization or every user. BRS interpreters are essential, and they may in many circumstances offer better service because of their experience serving ASL users in many different kinds of conversations. And certainly, most companies and many government agencies lack the scale to justify implementing a direct video calling solution. But there are reasons to believe that the specific focus on customer or public service among ASL-speaking CSAs might improve the efficiency of calls focused on precisely that customer or public service. Indeed, in certain applications, it may offer an experience to the deaf and hard-of-hearing community that is closer to functional equivalence than a relay call. 
Indeed, that seems to have been the feedback presented to this very committee about seven months ago when comments from an implementing DDC user were presented. As I understand it, FEMA is also set for a trial run for DDC implementation to begin next month, I believe. I'll be eager to see the outcome of that trial. I urge the members of this committee to continue to have studied this issue, and I will urge the chairwoman to embrace DVC as an opportunity to run experiments on what this technology can accomplish for functional equivalents. We should study the issue carefully. We should examine what the standards of DVC providers ought to be in order to achieve functional equivalents in DVC-enabled calls. And indeed, we should consider authorizing a limited pilot program within our statutory authority with the express purpose of evaluating direct video calling as a compensable service. And should our exploration provide improve successful, we should examine what our statutory authority is for ultimately authorizing TRS fund compensation for DVC services. If it turns out that at least in some cases, DVC is a more efficient and more effective form of video calling in certain applications than video relay, if the deaf and hard of hearing community affirmatively prefers direct video quality in certain applications to video relay calling, and if these are calls that need to get made anyway, is there any sense of sticking to just one form of communication? Doesn't functional equivalence in fact demand the examination of all communications options and technologies? Doesn't our essential focus on technology neutrality demand it? This is a technology about which I personally am excited, and I see no harm in further exploration of what the possibilities for a more effective, efficient, and equivalent future might look like. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak with you today. All right. My phone had something to say about that, but that was great um, feedback from the commissioner and exciting times. I think that'll be amazing. So um, great work being done and coming for all of us. Um, I now want to recognize Alejandro Rourke, who's chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau here at the FCC for a few remarks and a welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Alejandro Rourke. For those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, um, and I am the chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. I want to extend a warm welcome to everyone um, who is here today. Um, thank you for take, making the journey to FCC headquarters. I was just telling Diane that you guys all make this look so easy, but I know that there was a lot of work on the part of the staff. I know that it's a, it's a trek to come into the building, so I think I um, always appreciate you taking the time uh, to be here in person with us. So thank you guys. Um, I, I really just want to start at the top and underscore something that the chairwoman said, and that's an update on the affordable connectivity program. As many of you um, know who was able to join the various webinars that we have that we have had so far, we had one on the 17th and the 18th. Um, without, I, I think, new appropriated additional funding for the affordable connectivity program, the agency has unfortunately had to begun the wind down process. Um, and we know that, that, uh, that oftentimes um, broadband affordability is a significant barrier for members of the uh, disability rights community. So. Um, it's an important program. We are doing everything that we can to work with our colleagues in, in Congress, but you know, want to make sure that you all, as kind of like our, our core partners, have um, the most up-to-date and accurate information so that you can kind of relay to um, any consumers that have questions or um, any other groups that um, might want to know more about um, what to expect as we, in worst case scenario from, from my kind of personal perspective, have to continue to wind down the program. So um, like the chairwoman said, I mean, she said a, a lot of, I think, what I wanted to cover. She's always um, three steps ahead of all of us. Um, but we have a busy schedule today. After some updates from the Disability Rights Office, you'll receive a report and recommendation from the audio description file transmittal to Internet Protocol Video Programming Working Group. Okay, that's... <laughs> <It's a mouthful. laughs> um, okay, great. We don't have an acronym for that yet. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, this report examines uh, ways to improve um, the ability of audio description for streamed video programming, and we look forward to receiving your recommendations on steps that can be taken to expand the reach of this important service. Um, I'd like to recognize Tom, who led the audio description working group and delivered this report and recommendation to the full DAC. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we will also have a dialogue about accessible emergency communications with the FCC staff. You know, as we all know, and the chairwoman has said many times, you know, um, every second counts when we are reaching out to 911 or 988. So 
Um, I look forward to the discussion and I hope a possible solution for some of the challenges that we face in the field. Um, and then we will then receive updates on the progress of two working groups, best practices for quality telecommunications relay services for individuals with uh, multiple di uh, disabilities and best practices on the use of artificial intelligence uh, to caption live video programming. So thank you, Annie and Shadi for chairing these working groups. Again, I know that this is a lot of work so thank you for the meetings that I know you had, the wrangling that we know we had, the, the drafting that has either already happened or, is the, or will happen. Um, trust me, all of us here at the FCC really kind of understand the, the amount of effort that goes into all of this work. So I um, just want to extend my gratitude again. And of course, um, also thank you to the co-chairs of the DAC, um, Kim and Kyle for leading the DAC. Um, the DAC is important to the FCC and all of your input is vital for our many uh, proceedings. So I look forward to many more opportunities to work together to enhance disability access to modern communications, video programming, and emergency communications. So uh, very happy to be here in community with you all and I'm happy to turn the time back over to the next person on our, on our agenda. Thank you, Alejandro. <clears throat> I guess that's me. I'm Diane Burstein. I'm Deputy Bureau Chief of Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. For those of you who don't know me, and I um, just wanted to welcome you all to the winter meeting of this DAC. And um, just wanted to take a minute to thank the hardworking FCC staff that has put this together. Um, Susie Rosen Singleton, Chief of the Disability Rights Office. Josh Mendelson, who is the designated federal officer for the DAC. Um, the DRO staff members, Ivy Bonejo and Robert McConnell and our many DRO volunteers who are here today. Uh, staff from the commission meeting room and media relations, Amy Kresap, who's our accommodations coordinator, the interpreters, captioners, and many more. Thank you all for your efforts to make this meeting happen. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to Kim to uh, con continue with the meat of the meeting here. Thank you, Diane. Um, I just want to reiterate that, um, hello again, and that I'm Kim Charleston, co-chair of the Disability Advisory Committee, and I represent the um, Perkins School for the Blind on, um, on the DAC. And I'm pleased to recognize Kyle, um, my co-chair, for um, him to take it, take it away, uh, Kyle. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kyle Dixon. I'm Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at NCTA, representing cable operators and cable programming creators. I am very excited to see you all again. I think this is the third meeting uh, in this incarnation of the DAC. Um, and I'd echo the, the thanks for uh, both everything, everyone on this committee, but also for FCC staff for their extraordinary efforts to keep us all coordinated. Um, we've made a lot of progress, but clearly we have more to do. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to go ahead and turn it over to Josh Mendelson, our DAC designated federal officer or DFO. Josh. Hello, I'm Josh Mendelson, and I'm an attorney with the FCC, and I'm also the designated federal officer for the DAC. It's great to see all of you here and I'm thrilled that the weather here is, shall I say, decent with no snow. So thank you uh, for making your way here. I'm gonna just take a few minutes to cover some housekeeping and some rules and some protocols, just to make sure that we have a meeting that is smooth and efficient and effective for everybody. First, restrooms. I know that you've heard this before, so bear with me. Restrooms are just outside of this meeting room on the left and the right. And we do have volunteers present on both sides of this room who can assist or direct you. 
fire exits in case of an emergency. Please evacuate through the main doors via the back of this room and then proceed through the main entrance out of this building. If you cannot go out through the front, you can go out through the one side door that we have here. Meals and beverages, I would like to thank the Perkins School for the Blind for sponsoring the meals, breakfast, lunch, and beverages during this. So thank you, Kim. It's very generous. And please know that meals are for people who are seated at the table and for people who are assisting with this meeting or providing reasonable accommodations. During this meeting, only one person has the floor at a time. If you wish to speak, please take your name tent and raise it so that it is vertical and leave it upright until you are called on by one of the co-chairs. And when you're speaking, please pace yourself. And when you're done with your remark, please then lower your tent card. Also, don't forget to wait to begin speaking because the camera needs a moment to find you. Because we do have people in the control room who are monitoring this meeting and are trying to find the right person to focus the camera on. And if you use a microphone, there are microphones between people and there is a button, actually there are two buttons the one on the right with a tactile bump is for you to push and then leave it and then you can speak. Once you're done, you push that right button once again to then deactivate it. Also, the microphone is movable so as you I'm demonstrating right now. If you need to move the whole unit Please don't lift it by the microphone itself. Rather, pick it up by the base of the unit. And please know that the microphones, most of them were not charged overnight, so some may not be working. So as a result, we do have someone who will be wandering around the room with an independent microphone. So I apologize for that. Uh, that was a last minute conundrum that we're faced with. And so now we're going with our backup plan. And this meeting is open to the public. And so there are people in the audience on both sides of the room. There are also people who are viewing this meeting via live stream. If you have any questions questions or comments, and you're watching this, you can send your question or comment to livequestions at FCC.gov. And I will check in and see if anyone physically has any questions here in the room before I turn the floor back over to Kyle. Any questions at this time? Well, thank you, and have a good meeting. Kyle? Great. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, uh, it's my opportunity to start the roll call. So we will start with myself, as I said. I am Kyle Dixon, Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at NCTA. Uh, I'll turn it to Kim, and then we'll proceed around the uh, rectangle uh, to my left with Kim. Thank you. I think you've heard from me, Kim Charlson, co-chair from Watertown, Massachusetts. Uh, 
Rachel Nemeth with the Consumer Technology Association. Sarah Miller with the American Foundation for the Blind. Shelley Blakeney, T-Mobile. Um, buenos dias, Maria Victoria Diaz, Dicapta. Tom Litkowski, Comcast, NBC Universal. I'm Michael Maddox with Sorensen Communications. Katie Schmidt with the Ark of the United States. Good morning, everybody. Michael Strecker with Clear Captions. Zachary Bastian, Verizon. Darlene Parker, National Captioning Institute. Tabitha Kenlin, American Council of the Blind. Josh Pyla, National Association of Broadcasters. Jennifer Campadel, VITAC. Lindsay Morris, um, University of Pittsburgh Wireless Rehabilitation Research Center on Wireless Technologies. Lisa Hamlin, Hearing Loss Association of America, and I just want to say hello and good morning to everyone, too. Shadi Abuzara, Amazon. Linda Vandeloup, AT&T. Megan Stahl, Apple. Kate Elkins from the U.S. Department of Transportation's NHTSA Office uh, of EMS and the National 911 Program. Good morning, Beth Slough, Hamilton Relay. Avenue Bell, CTIA. Good morning, everyone. I am Brianne Berger. I work for the Department of Education. Mark Hill here, and I work with the Cerebral Palsy and Deaf Organization. Karen Peltz-Strauss, representing Communication Service for the Deaf. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rene Pellerin, and I am representing the American Association of the Deafblind. Good morning. Hi, Amanda Montgomery, and I am with Convo Communications. Good morning, good to see everyone. Hi, I am Lisa Bothwell, and I am with the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, I am with the Administration for Community Living. Hello, my name is Annie Uraski, and I am representing the National Association of State Agencies for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. I'm still Karen Peltz-Strauss, representing Communication Service for the Deaf. <laughs> Christina Duarte with Animal Caption. Calandra again, good to see you guys. Diane Burstein, same. Uh, Michael Scott, uh, Deputy Chief in the Disability Rights Office. Hello, everyone. Susie Rosen Singleton, Chief of the Disability Rights Office. Josh Mendelson, Designated Federal Officer of the DAC. Wonderful. Uh, I think that's everyone at the table. Did we miss anyone? Great, perfect. Um, next, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Susie Rosen Singleton, Chief of the Disability Rights Office, and DRO Deputy Chief Michael Scott to give us some updates on FCC actions over the past several months. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our third meeting of the fifth term. I would like to echo everyone's sentiments here, sentiments of gratitude. This could not be done without all of you. We have such a wonderful DRO team and wonderful people in attendance. 
Thank you all. Thank you, Josh, for your leadership with the DAC. It's very much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. As you might recall from the recent DAC meeting, we had Elliot Greenwald with us to share a few updates. Unfortunately, after 18 years of service, he has retired. We appreciate all his years of service, and I am very much pleased to introduce Michael Scott, who is now the new deputy chief for rulemaking proceedings. Michael joined us eight and a half years ago and has primarily focused on policy work, relay services matters, and the like. He has done so as an attorney advisor, and we're very fortunate to have someone with his experience and qualifications to serve as the new deputy chief for rulemaking proceedings. Let's give him a round of applause as we welcome him to our team. Thanks everyone, looking forward to working together and continuing the great work that's been done. Now onwards, I'd like to spotlight a few things. Some have already been mentioned and covered by the chairwoman, as well as our bureau chief, Alejandro Rourke. They have shared about the affordable connectivity program and that is really our top priority of the day, is our ACP wind down processes. Ensuring that everyone knows your organizations are pivotal in disseminating information and awareness to your membership about our wind down efforts. February 7th is the last day to apply for enrollment and we strongly encourage everyone to take a look at www.fcc.gov slash ACP for additional information as well as an ASL video. If you have any questions, please do let us know. Email us at acpinfo at fcc.gov. You should also know that people are able to qualify and subscribe to both Lifeline and ACP concurrently. So please do share that information as well. Now moving on to the next topic, as you have again heard from previous speakers about emergency access. We did have a test of the emergency alert system that took place on October 4th. Prior to that October 4th date, we had gone ahead and notified all industry participants that they must have accessibility requirements implemented and in place. And the purpose of this test was to evaluate the effectiveness of those implementations. We met with key stakeholders to discuss accessibility and I can't thank you all enough for your feedback and your engagement in this process. A report will be released soon to share the findings of that nationwide test. January 25th, we had an open meeting during which we adopted a report in order. And this report in order had to do with wireless carriers being required to implement location-based routing services nationwide for wireless callers, as well as RTT, real-time text. Location must be routed not based upon the tel cell tower that is taking the call, but the location of the caller placing the call. This allows for more precise location determination, bringing emergency services more rapidly, reducing delay, or the need to transfer callers based upon routing via cell tower. This will be implemented 24 months from now for nationwide mobile service providers. A correction, six months from now for nationwide mobile service providers and 24 months from now for non-nationwide providers. And RTT to 91 well must be implemented as well. All mobile providers must implement that service within 24 months and we can help expedite this process this allows for faster and more accurate call routing. Audio descriptions, as you've also heard from the chairwoman, we recently adopted the second report in order on audio descriptions. This report in order works to phase in the audio description requirements. And in 2035, we will have a complete saturation of markets, all markets, 210, will be required to have audio descriptions, which is 100% requirement for all. That's fantastic work. 
Second thing on audio descriptions is November 30th, 2023, we re released a public notice to announce the National Non-Broadcast Network rankings for the fourth triannual update. And this will occur July 1st, 2024. Top 10 rankings at this time for non-broadcast networks for the 2022 to 2023 rankings year are Fox News Channel, ESPN, MSNBC, HGTV, Hallmark, TLC, TNT, TBS, Discovery, and History. We are currently looking at some requests. Several of those have made for exemption, including ESPN, Fox News Channel, and MSNBC. Those three have already filed for exemptions. We will announce in the near future, which will be completed by July 1st. Now, on to hearing aid compatibility. As the chairwoman again mentioned, Earlier, we have adopted a notice of proposed rulemaking that tentatively concludes that hearing aid compatibility, or HAC, should be at 100% for wireless handset models. We are seeking comment on how we may implement that 100% requirement. Our comment period has already been announced. February 26 is the date for initial comments and March 11th for reply comments. To this, we are seeking comments on, and I'll just share very briefly here, a broader definition of hearing aid compatibility to incorporate Bluetooth technology. We are also looking at the 85 and 15% requirements. 85% requirement for telecoil coupling, and 15% would be the requirement for Bluetooth coupling. Keeping in mind that both will have acoustic coupling requirements for 100%. Taking a look at that numbers, we would appreciate your thoughts and feedback. We're also looking at whether or not to incorporate specific non-proprietary Bluetooth connectivity technology into the hearing aid compatibility rules, or whether to allow the market to make that determination. We're looking at whether or not we should include volume control as part of the 100% hack requirement, reviewing various timelines for 100% adaptability bench compatibility benchmarks, and other issues as well. For example, what type of hearing aid compatibility settings should be included on your phones? Labeling and disclosure rules, what should those look like? Revised website and record retention as well as reporting requirements. We are seeking feedback on that. Posting of a company's contact information for consumers who may have questions about that particular company's hearing aid compatible handset models. We currently do not have any rules in place that require such companies to provide contact information. Also seeking is whether or not we should rename the hack in the section as is. It doesn't seem as though the name is quite clear, so we are seeking recommendations on whether or not it should be renamed to better fit the section. We have also released an order waiving the partial wireless hack rules, those that required volume control requirements. We have given a waiver for a two-year period in order to allow for this flawed standard to be redesigned. The Alliance for Telecommunication Industry Solutions, or ATIS, has shared with us that they will be sharing a report on the status of the development of new volume control standards coming in September 2024. So we are looking at how to re-implement volume control standards that are workable. Before I turn the floor back over to Michael, just one last comment. November 15th, we had an open meeting. We, during that meeting, adopted four different items. And I'd like to share with you these, uh, some you've already heard from the chairwoman about. The first was preventing digital discrimination, a report and order, as well as FNPRM. This was to implement section 60506 
of the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act of 2021. The Commission must establish a framework to facilitate equal access to broadband internet access services in order to prevent digital discrimination based on income level, race, ethnicity, color, religion, and national origin. While the report and order recognizes that disability is not listed as a protected characteristic in the statute, <coughs> the commission work will not begin or end with this statute. The commission will continue to address disability access in broadband under other sources of authority. Second is safe connection report and order. As you heard from the chairwoman, we adopted rule to implement line separation provisions in order to ensure that domestic abuse survivors have the ability to separate their mobile phone line from an account shared with an abuser. On accessibility, we are ensuring that in that document, it contains requirements that they must have a process in order to provide similar access to people with disabilities. Materials must be provided in alternative formats, such as braille, large print, as well as any requests for separate line provisions provided in similar content. Next, we have our AI robocalls NOI notice of inquiry. Comment period has closed January 16th, but we are seeking feedback from all of you on how we can protect accessibility while still protecting consumers from unwanted and illegal robocalls and texts. The final item is SIM swap uh, report and order. These are the four that were adopted on the November 15th open meeting. This fourth item on SIM swap and port out fraud, these are two fraudulent practices that bad actors use to take control of a consumer cell phone. We have included that document to ensure that in the implementation of new authentication methods, that those methods are accept <coughs> excuse me, accessible to people with disabilities. The date for that new requirement is June 8th, 2024, or after the FCC receives approval from the Office of Management and Budget under the Paperwork Reduction Act process, whichever is later. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I know that was a lot of information. Uh, we do have access infos, so feel free to take a look at our website for further information about all that was just shared. I'm also happy to answer questions after I turn it over to Michael. Thank you, Susie. Uh, give me a second to find me in the room here. Oh, there we go. There it is. Thank you. Right. And, and thank you, Susie. And, and thank you to everyone. I appreciate your warm welcome here this morning. Uh, you know, Elliot left behind some pretty big shoes to fill but he also had the same advantage as I do of an excellent team at the DRO. And, and in my hope for your continued insights and guidance and feedback from all of you and the other stakeholders in the community so that we can continue our excellent work here at the commission. So now to continue on with some of our highlights since the last meeting we had. Um, VR, VRS compensation, uh, so in late September, the commission released a new compensation plan for the for the provision of video relay service. The commission adopted a five-year compensation plan with annual adjustments for inflation. Uh, we continued with our tiered rate compensation structure where for any provider handling more than one million minutes per month, the compensation level was $6.27 per minute for the first million minutes and $3.92 per minute for any additional monthly minutes. For VRS providers handling fewer, one million minutes or fewer VRS minutes per month, the compensation formula is $7.77 per minute. We also ad adopted a new add-on compensation for the provision of what we call video to text 
service, which is a specialized form of DRS, and we allow an additional compensation of 19 cents per minute. We also, as a part of that item, there was also a further notice of proposed rulemaking, and where we seek comment on whether and under what circumstances to provide compensation for other types of specialized services, such as the use of certified deaf interpreters, skill-based interpreting, or interpreting through other non-ASL methods of communication. We also seek comment on any rule changes needed to facilitate the provision of video text service and other forms of specialized services. Uh, the commission will release a public notice to announce the comment dates of that item. We've also had a DRS provider changes. In late September, the commission granted um, four conditional waivers to Sorensen to help ensure the continuous availability of DRS to individuals who are deafblind following the exit of Global DRS from the market, who, had, who at the time was the sole provider of the video text service. In late October, the commission granted a conditional certification to Hive LLC as a provider of video relay services for two years pending further review of its application <coughs> and its provision of DRS during the certification period. Then we also had a, another order related to DRS. In late December, we adopted what we called the uh, DRS Improvements Order to modify several DRS rules that had been waived since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. The commission increased from 50 to 80% the portion of DRS providers' monthly minutes that may be handled by CAs working at home it modified the amount of prior interpreting experience required for a communication assistant who works at home from three years down to one year. And the rule changes also allow a VRS provider to contract for interpreting services for up to 30% of its monthly minutes. It also permits the TRS fund compensation of calls placed by VRS providers, sorry, allows for the compensation of TRS fund compensation of calls placed by VRS to the United States by someone outside for up to one year after they leave the country as long as they notify the provider of such travel prior to the time they make their first phone call. The waiver of the prior rules will remain in effect pending the effective date of the new rules and the transition, as well as a transition period for the number of minutes handled by CAs working from home. The item also clarified the commission rules for calculating the annual inflation adjustment for IT relay compensation. Now, the commission, also in December, the commission extended the current IPCTS compensation rate paid to IPCTS providers through the earlier of June 30th, 2024, or the effective date of commission action revising the compensation formula. We've also had some IPCTS provider changes. Uh, this month, the Commission has granted four conditional certifications to four entities that will provide IPCTS, Global Caption, Nagish, Next Talk, and Roger Voice. The conditional certification for each provider is two years. During that time, the Commission will continue to review each provider's application and provision of IPCTS as it considers whether to grant full certification. The Commission also released a public notice seeking comment on an application filed by Clear Captions LLC and CC Opportunities LLC for a conditional certification as a provider of IPCTS after a proposed acquisition of Clear Captions by CC Opportunities. The comment period for that notice closes February 16th. Uh, now on to some, just some other matters. In October, the Commission released a public notice seeking comment on a petition for a one-year extension of the January 1 deadline for providers of incarcerated people's communication services to all forms of TRS available at covered correctional facilities. Um, following an extension of, a co of the comment period that closed on November 29th, and that petition remains pending. Um, finally, one last update. In December, the Commission released a report in order to update its data breach notification rules to ensure providers of telecommunication, um, interconnected voice over IP, uh, VOIP, and TRS adequately safeguards sensitive customer information. 
the item requires carriers and TRS providers to notify the Commission of breaches in addition to their current obligations to notify the Secret Service and the FBI via a, a central reporting facility. It eliminates a notification requirement of a breach in those instances where a carrier or TRS provider can reasonably determine that no harm to the customer is reasonably likely to occur as a result of the breach or where the breach solely involves encrypted data and the carrier or provider has definitive evidence that the encryption key was not accessed, used, or disclosed. It also eliminates the mandatory waiting period for carriers and TRS providers to notify customers. Instead, carriers and TRS providers must notify customers of breaches of covered data without unreasonable delay after notification to the Commission and law enforcement agencies, but in no case later than 30 days after reasonable determination of a breach unless a delay is requested by law enforcement. Thank you, everyone. Turn it back over. Thank you, Susie and Michael. Uh, for those important FCC updates. Uh, next on our agenda is the report and recommendation of the audio description file transmittal to Internet Protocol Video Programming Working Group. Um, as always, uh, during these meetings, uh, to the extent an FCC commissioner uh, stops by to, to greet the group, um, we will interrupt uh, our deliberations. Um, but uh, in the absence of that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to a gentleman to my left, uh, Tom Ludkowski, who is Vice President for Accessibility and Multicultural Technology at Comcast, who has been herding the cat, so to speak, um, on this uh, working group on audio description file transmittal to internet protocol video programming. Tom, and if you could wait a second for the camera to find you. <coughs> Thank you, Kyle. Uh, good morning, everybody. Tom Litkowski with Comcast NBC Universal. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, submit the uh, report from this long named audio description working group that we'll get into here in a second uh, to consideration by the full DAC. And uh, we can kind of tackle this in a, in a variety of ways, but given the length of the report, um, what I thought I would do is read uh, the majority of the introduction because that kind of lays out the group's approach, it lays out the commission's assignment, and then get into um, the recommendations. There are several sections to the report which DAC members have received in advance of the meeting, so hopefully you've had a chance to read it. Uh, the introduction and then there's the first section, which is an overview of the audio description ecosystem, and that ranges from the creation of the audio description from vendors like the CAPTA or VITAC or NCI or the many others that are out there uh, through the actual delivery ultimately to the consumer through a broadcast network, a streaming service, uh, a cable distributor, I uh, can't forget who pays my check, and, and others. So um, rather than get into each one of those sections, we'll uh, hope that the uh, DAC members have read this, um, and then we'll cover the introduction. And then the section, the final section of the report is um, an opportunities section in which the recommendations are included, and there are four opportunities, each of which has rationale behind it and the recommendation. Uh, so before I go any further, are there any comments, concerns, or questions with that approach from either the co-chairs or members of the DAC? Okay. Um, so I will take silence as no news is good news and begin reading the introduction here. This report developed by the audio description file transmittal for internet protocol delivered video programming working group, ADIPWG, because Alejandro was looking for an acronym. So the ADIPWG, otherwise working group, uh, 
uh, of the FCC's Disability Advisory Committee has developed this report to address the Commission's request for the committee to, quote, identify issues and best practices associated with the transmittal to and receipt of audio description by video programming providers and distributors so that audio description files associated with full-length programming remain available regardless of the distribution method, end quote. This report does not cover distribution of live linear broadcast or traditional cable quadrature amplitude modulation content delivery. It also does not address quality, fidelity, nor measurement of the quality of audio description. The DAC offers no opinion about, one, whether or to what extent the Commission has the requisite authority to act on the content of this report, or two, any other aspect of the scope of the Commission's authority. Nothing in this report should be construed to concede any arguments by any member of the DAC related to the content of this report, including any Commission proceeding related to the topics of this report. This may include arguments related to costs, benefits, burdens, the civil and human rights of people with disabilities, or other considerations. Based on its interpretation of the Commission's request, the Committee focused its considerations primarily on issues attendant in the distribution of already described programming and associated assets. Moreover, this report is not intended to be an exhaustive discussion of issues related to the distribution of already described programming, but instead provides a high-level overview of the current ecosystem and highlights technical, human, and organizational process challenges and opportunities to address them. The Committee recommends that the Commission foster awareness of the report among participants in the ecosystem and work with participants to address the challenges and pursue the recommendations identified in the report. So with that, any questions or comments? Everybody enjoying their coffee as we go here? All right, so we're going to switch to the recommendations at this point unless somebody has any questions about the sections of the report. So as I said, uh, this is section Roman numeral three, if you're following along in your document, um, Braille page 28, couldn't tell you, anybody have the printed page number? In case anybody wants to follow this. Tom? Yes? Uh, I hate to interrupt, um, but uh, we do have one of our FCC commissioners here, so I would love to uh, interrupt our deliberations and invite uh, Commissioner Brendan Carr to address the group. All right. Uh, well, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to address you and at the outset before I start I just want to express uh, my gratitude and my appreciation for all of you for taking the time to be here today but more broadly to participate with this group. I know all of you have very important, very big probably uh, day jobs and lots of competing commitments and the idea that you take this on in addition to it uh, is something again that I want to express my thanks for. But I also think it goes to show the importance and value of the work that's taking place here. We spent a lot of time at the FCC focused on the digital divide, uh, and we talk about it usually as two sides of a coin with access and affordability, uh, but I think it's actually a, a problem and a challenge that is much more multifaceted than just that. And I think the work of this group uh, in particular helps highlight this, because one of the important features of the digital divide, in my view, and the work that we have both a statutory obligation to do under the CVAA and other uh, statutes, but also a, a moral imperative to do, is to make sure that in closing the digital divide, we make sure that next generation connectivity is available to every American, um, and that includes the disability community. And the FC has a lot of 
programs underway designed to achieve that. We have to that we have a solid, uh, foundation for a lot of our captioning programs, which we are doing. Um, but there's so many additional ways that when we really focus on it, um, technology can help bridge the divide and make sure that every single person has a fair shot at next generation connectivity. And I think we're seeing, really maybe for the first time in a couple of years, a, a rapid acceleration in the way that technology can help in ways that are directly relevant uh, to this committee. You know, I was watching uh, TV the other day and I saw an ad, I won't say which particular provider had the ad, I don't wanna you know, play favorites there, uh, but it was an ad about uh, Gallaudet, the football team for Gallaudet, uh, located obviously just a few blocks from the FCC, and showed how they were using 5G to help deliver play calls into the helmets of the Gallaudet football team, um, giving them another sort of opportunity to participate and play uh, on a, a level playing field with other teams. And I think as we're seeing the movement, particularly away from expensive um, custom equipment to at least in some cases, the ability to rely much more on software to drive accessibility features, I think that's something important, but of course, there is a place to this day, obviously, for bespoke, um, can be expensive, hardware as well. So I think we have to balance our approach at the FCC between continuing to support um, one-off technologies where it's necessary, but also helping to ensure a migration to software um, in general use technologies that can also be used for accessibility. And one area in particular is captioning, where I think we can make some more progress. I know this group has a report today uh, on one feature of captioning technology. But I think more broadly, there's a lot of talk these days about um, AI, artificial intelligence. And I think captioning is one interesting area where AI can help improve as we're increasingly transitioning away from CAs, communications assistants, to technology to help do captioning and there's still some error rates there. Obviously, we have to get better, but I think it's one area where AI in particular uh, can help us achieve our goals there. Um, and so again, I'm just particularly grateful for the time that you all are putting into uh, this committee. Look forward to the, the captioning proposal you all are presenting today, and more generally, the work that you're doing so that we can emphasize the need to solve this component uh, of the digital divide, which again is part of our statutory obligation, but responsibility to do as well. Um, with that, I'm happy to let you guys get back to work, or if there is you know, a question or two, I'm also happy to, to stick around uh, for that as well. But, uh, but thank you again for all your work. Thank you, Commissioner, for your insightful comments. <laughs> we appreciate your leadership on these issues. And with that, I will turn it back to Tom, and again, uh, pause for the camera to reach you. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Uh, we are continuing now with the uh, opportunities section of the audio description working group report. Um, and so section three uh, is titled Potential Opportunities in the Audio Description Ecosystem for Participants and the Commission. And of course, participants are those vendors who create the audio description the content owners slash creators, programmers, networks, uh, distributors, and, um, and other, other folks in the chain uh, uh, as well. So uh, this section discusses opportunities for participants in the AD ecosystem to address the challenges that uh, are listed in the previous section of this report. The first opportunity is delivery of audio description scripts with timestamps. The rationale is during the regular production process, creators slash vendors use a script with timestamps for the creation of audio description. The group's recommendation to the commission is to encourage vendors to provide and content creators to request AD scripts with timestamps in addition 
to the AD audio files. By doing so, it may become easier to re-record the description in cases of edits or reformats and feasible to stream or present these texts to blind and deafblind audiences through different distribution outlets. At least one major consumer technology vendor can already render standard caption and subtitle content to Braille users, and multiple major vendors are actively investigating using the VTT caption format to send timed transcriptions of audio description narration to Braille displays. Tom? Yes. Sorry to interrupt again. Uh, we have uh, Commissioner Jeffrey Starks, and I would invite uh, Commissioner Starks to, to speak with us. Good morning, all. Uh, I was just saying it looks like um, uh, it's the start of the morning here, but you all have quite a full slate. Uh, and I would expect no less given um, the immense and tremendous, important, valuable work that you all have done, ha will continue to do, and, uh, and, and what we expect from you all. You really do help us think through some of the most complex and important issues uh, and so good morning here again. Honored to be here. Uh, the vital work that you do for this agency and the American people truly benefit. Everyone in America deserves access to modern communications. This guides so much of the work that we do here at the FCC from fostering competition to championing affordability to ensuring functional equivalency and accessibility. Since I last spoke with you, I know I've had the pleasure of speaking with you all a number of times, uh, but since I've last spoken with you, the commission in particular has taken a number of important steps to promote accessibility across services, and I'd like to just spend a few moments um, uh, sharing those with you, what I think is some of the important work that we've been able to accomplish together, truly. First, in September, we adopted a new rate card for video relay service providers. Of course, that's important and necessary work, especially to VRS providers, but there are key features in the order that are focused on VRS users, and which I appreciate the opportunity to call out. Before our September order, providers could only receive compensation from the TRS fund for research and development conducted to ensure that their service met the mandatory minimum, minimum standards for VRS. If a company wanted to pursue R&D and go above that, that was on their own dime. Now in markets with more players, more competition, that might be enough to spur innovation, innovation but the VRS market is unique in many ways, and so providers Many folks who are advising us here said that this limitation hampered their ability to explore important service improvements like geolocation for 911, like integration with video conferencing platforms, like direct dial access to 988, life-saving services and many of those. Hearing users have the benefit of all of these improvements, which cuts to the issue of functional equivalency, is what we focused on. I'm proud to say that we revised our allowable cross criteria to allow the fund to support reasonable costs of R&D to enhance the functional equivalen equivalency of VRS. I hope and expect to see VRS providers take advantage of this. Second that I would commend and highlight to this group. Staying on the topic of those who are hearing impaired, in December we adopted a proposal that put us down a path to ensuring that every single smartphone sold in America can be used with hearing aids. Every model, all of them. That's 100%. Reaching 100% compatibility will give hearing impaired consumers more choice and that's the reason enough to invest in this reality. But our HAC efforts also show 
that we can absolutely achieve equal access to communications without compromise. It's gonna take hard work, innovation, commitment, collaboration, but I really mean this. Whether we're talking hearing aid compatibility or the digital divide, don't ever tell me that 100% is impossible. Finally, because I understand you'll be hearing from Public Safety uh, Bureau on Emergency Communications and a number of important initiatives we've taken there, I wanna mention two efforts we have to enhance accessibility on emergency alerts. And this is absolutely critical work. By definition, we're talking emergencies where time, minutes, moments are of the essence. And so alert recipients must be able to receive, understand, act upon, these emergency alerts immediately, and so we can't have large swaths of Americans, whether they are vision or hearing impaired, non-English or Spanish speakers, get left behind. And so in October, we issued an order requiring mobile service providers who participate in the wireless emergency alert system to support alerts in American Sign Language, ASL, and in the 13 most commonly spoken non-English languages in the country. And next month, we will vote on a proposal seeking comment on how to develop and implement ASL alerts for our television and radio emergency alert system, as well as how to create template alert scripts in 13 additional languages. Again, this is going to take time, is going to be hard work, but we have the resolve that we need. It's all the more reason for us to get started. So thank you all truly for your hard work, your good work on these important issues. Thank you to CGB. Uh, and the team here, as ever, for the hard work. I see so many friends across the room um, that, uh, that I know, that know me. Uh, as always, I'm an open door commissioner. Please do continue to uh, do the hard work that you need to do in this room uh, today and beyond. Uh, and I wish you, um, um, you know, Godspeed on your work here today on accessibility issues more broadly and a productive meeting. As always, be safe and be well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, with that, I will turn it back to Tom. Thank you, Kyle. So uh, we're continuing with the first opportunity in our recommendation section uh, titled Delivery of Audio Description Trans uh, Delivery of Audio Description Scripts with Timestamps. And uh, continuing on with that rationale and the recommendation, it says uh, delivery of time-coded description scripts along with narration-only audio description files may also help facilitate the editing of audio description when video has been recut for length, content, or advertising reasons. A any comments or questions on the first uh, recommendation to encourage vendors to deliver audio description scripts with timestamps. Okay, we'll move on to the second opportunity and recommendation, which is provision of narration only audio description files. And the rationale is that vendors already have access to narrated narration only audio description files during the creation of AD before they are mixed into the main soundtrack. The final AD audio mix that consumers receive should be of equivalent quality to the original program audio. The recommendation is to encourage vendors to deliver these unmixed audio files to stakeholders. This will facilitate the creation of audio in the diverse formats and environments currently or prospectively used on streaming platforms and digital broadcasts. There are also emerging technologies, such as new immersive audio formats, like object-based audio for Dolby Atmos, or local broadcast technologies, like Bluetooth public broadcast profile and Auracast, where wider access to the unmixed audio files may facilitate faster adoption of new consumer features. In addition to the main program audio and fully mixed AD, 
encourage vendors to deliver these unmixed audio files to stakeholders as part of a default delivery requirement. Any comments, questions, concerns on the second opportunity concerning narration only audio description? Okay, then we'll move to the third opportunity and, recomm and recommendation, which is tracking process and the rationale. To promote ease of finding and providing AD as programming is made available on additional platforms, enable program distributors to identify and locate audio description files that may have already been created for assets distributed across vendors. A recommendation is that we encourage the FCC to facilitate a workshop between content creators, AD vendors, distributors, and consumer groups to discuss potential solutions for tracking and cataloging the creation, ownership, and availability of AD assets across platforms, services, and distribution channels. Because Possible solutions may provide a similar benefit for captions or for CC slash SDH assets and other media alternatives. We encourage the workshop participants to consider more media alternatives beyond AD alone. So any comments, questions, concerns concerning the third opportunity concerning a tracking process? All right, and the fourth opportunity and recommendation is process for contacting companies. The rationale, consumers often do not know how to contact companies in the event there are issues with AD in programming or delivery. The recommendation is to encourage industry participants, distributors and content owners, to establish and identify specific processes and effective communication channels for consumers to raise AD questions and concerns. Also encourage industry participants to register accessibility contacts specifically for audio description in the FCC FPD registry at https colon slash slash www.fcc.gov slash VPD registry. Encourage industry participants to investigate and resolve complaints, including by, uh, let's encourage industry participants to investigate and resolve complaints, including by collaborating with other industry participants to resolve consumer issues. Any questions, comments, concerns around the ind industry contact recommendation? All right. I think uh, we are nearing the end of the AD, IP, WG, whatever we are, working group here. Um, because now we're at the point of taking a full vote on the report by the DAC. And I'll turn it back to our co-chairs to guide us through that vote. Uh, thank you, Tom. That was a, a fantastic amount of material. Um, you made it seem easy. I know it was not. Um, with that, I would just like to see whether there of the formal members of the DAC, if there are any who object to the recommendation. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Um, I think with that, we have approved the recommendation absent any objection. So thank you all for your work on this. I know there are a lot of folks that uh, participated in this effort, and so we thank you for that. being told we need to actually vote. <laughs> Sorry about the, about the housekeeping. Uh, so I'd just like to call a vote of the members of the DAC. Um, and why don't I start to my left uh, with uh, Rachel. 
Yeah, CTA votes, yes. The American Foundation for the Blind votes yes. T-Mobile votes yes. Decapta votes yes. Comcast NBC Universal votes yes. Sorensen votes yes. The Arc of the United States votes yes. Clear Captions votes yes. Verizon votes yes. National Captioning Institute votes yes. American Council of the Blind votes yes. National Association of Broadcasters votes yes. VITAC votes yes. Wireless RERC votes yes. Hearing Loss Association of America votes yes. Amazon votes yes. AT&T votes yes. Apple votes yes. Hamilton Relay votes yes. CTIA votes yes. U.S. Department of Education abstained. Cerebral palsy votes yes. AADP abstains. Combo communications votes yes. Health and Human Services abstains. Communication service for the deaf votes yes. We missed Annie. Do you mind? The interpreter missed Annie. Do you mind again? Apologies. NSADHH votes yes. Thank you so much. Annual caption votes yes. And NCTA votes yes. Thank you everyone for your patience with me. <laughs> um, with that, uh, we've seen a whole lot of information and I think it's a good time for us to take a very brief 10 minute break. Um, I want to remind the public that they can submit questions to livequestions at FCC.gov. That's uh, one word, livequestions at FCC.gov. Um, and also a reminder uh, for those of you here, uh, the restrooms are immediately to the left and right after exiting this conference room. See you in about 10 minutes. All right, everyone. Hope you enjoyed your break, and now we will resume our um, our presentations for this morning. So, thank you again. I'm Kim Charlson, and I'm I've always been extremely interested in our next topic. So I'm really interested to hear from the team about emergency. Um, preparedness and emergency information. And I'm gonna recognize um, Susie to uh, introduce the presenters for this segment of our agenda. Thank you, hello everyone. Welcome back from break. This is such an important topic. I would like to give you a little bit of a backstory about this discussion or dialogue that's taking place now. Accessible emergency communications has long been an FCC priority. As we've heard from the commissioners this morning, truly every second counts. 
So how do we ensure that we have accessible ways of reaching 988 and 911? That's truly the focus of today's dialogue. We do have two subject matter experts here to share with us this morning. There are a few caveats. Keep in mind, we do have a very limited time frame that we are working in, so we are focusing only on communications and not notifications. So WIA, the wireless emergency alerts, those systems will not be focused on during today's discussion. We will be discussing 988 and 911. We'll also be discussing matters under our purview. So we will not be discussing any accessible communications in terms of discussions with emergency personnel on site, rather using utilizing the telecommunications aspect of 988 and 911. Our goal for today's dialogue is really, it's a shared goal, is to ensure that we have effective outreach and to further explore what the expectations may be, the requirements, the concerns. This is truly an opportunity for you all to ask questions as well following their presentation. I would like to say the best way to prepare for an emergency is not to underestimate it. So with that, I would like to welcome our two subject matter experts. We have Bill Wallace, an attorney advisor with the Disability Rights Office in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. And we have Rachel Weir, an attorney advisor in the Policy and Licensing Division for Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, PSHSB. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome uh, to this discussion. So, Rachel, I'd like to ask you to start off. Um, so what happens, what are the options to contact 911 if I have a disability? And when I dial 911, what typically happens today with that call? Sure, good morning everybody. So people with disabilities can contact 911 by calling using voice, texting, TTY or through relay services. We'll discuss each of these options more fully shortly. When you dial 911, the originating provider for your call, which could be a wireless provider or a landline provider, for example, is required to route your call to the appropriate public safety answering point, PSAP or 911 call center, that is designated for your location. The carrier also generally must provide 9 the 911 call center with a callback number in case you get disconnected as well as information about the location from which you're calling. So Rachel, who is going to answer my 911 call? And is it the same for voice calls and text messages? So the 911 call center that answers your call or text is designated by a state or a local entity that has the authority and responsibility to designate which 911 call center will receive calls within a specific geographic area. 911 call centers are generally designated to receive calls based on a jurisdiction, such as within the boundaries of a city or within the boundaries of a county. How do the, the police or an ambulance know how to find me when I call 911? The type of location information that a carrier delivers along with your call depends on the type of technology that you're using to call 911. Dispatchable location is considered to be the gold standard of location information that can be delivered with a 911 call or text. The commission defines dispatchable location as the validated street address of the calling party, plus the additional information such as suite number, apartment number, or similar information that's necessary to adequately identify the location from which you are calling. This capability has long existed for wireline calls because those are fixed calls. Um, and they're also delivered to the PSAP based on the caller's street address. Increasingly, dispatchable location has become the goal for wireless, VoIP, and other 911 calls as well, and our rules require the provision of dispatchable location with any 911 call where it is technologically feasible at a reasonable cost. Is there a difference in how quickly they can find me if I use my home phone or my mobile phone? So it does depend on the type of technology used to make the call. Different specificity of location information will be available automatically. The most precise location information comes from fixed technologies like landline, fixed VoIP, and fixed internet-based TRS. With all technologies, it's very important to communicate your location as precisely as possible to the 911 call taker. For wireless providers, if you have a service contract with a wireless provider, that provider must um, must provide automatic location information um, within 50 meters. The Commission has also begun to require providers to provide vertical location information as well, but the rollout of this capability is still ongoing. 
In addition, wireless providers must transmit non-service initialized or NSI 911 calls, even if the caller is not a subscriber, as long as the phone used by the caller is compatible with the CMRS provider's network. This means that wireless providers must carry 911 calls from phones with expired minutes or without a service contract. However, there are some limits on these requirements. When you make a call from an NSI phone, location is not available automatically. In addition, these requirements only apply to voice calls, meaning that the Commission does not require wireless carriers to transmit text to 911, including both SMS and RTT, if you don't have a service contract with your provider. For landline, landline providers have to provide automatic dispatchable locations. That's that gold standard of location information, your validated street address, plus the additional information needed to find you. For VoIP, for fixed VoIP, once again, it's dispatchable location, the same as landline calls. For non-fixed VoIP, if automatic dispatchable location isn't technically feasible, the provider must provide registered location, that is user-provided location information, alternative location information, which can be coordinate-based, that is sufficient to identify the caller's civic address to an approximate in-building location, including floor level, or route the call to a national emergency call center. So, Bill, I use a relay service. Does calling 911 work the same way for a relay service? There may be a few differences, but internet-based relay services must also deliver, deliver your telephone number and location to the appropriate PSAP based on your location. For example, if you are using video relay service or IP relay service, you will be connected to the PSAP by a communications assistant who will relay the information you provide <clears throat> and s tell you what the PSAP says back. If you're using internet protocol caption telephone service, then you would be connected directly with the PSAP and the CA would just be providing captions of what the PSAP says. There may also be differences in location information provided to the PSAP. When you are using a, <clears throat> a TRS application on your mobile phone, you're connected over the internet unless you have turned on location for that application, the provider may not have your automatic uh, location information. All internet-based TRS providers, like VoIP providers, are required to collect from you your registered location, which is typically the default location where you can be found, for example, at home. They will al also ask for your dispatchable location, which is where you are when you are calling. <coughs> Specifically, uh, fixed location VRS and IP relay, the CA should request your name and dispatchable location, connect to the designated PSAP, provide your telephone number, <coughs> the name of the TRS provider, and the CA's ID number for callback, deliver automatic dispatchable location, uh, either through the communications assistant or directly to the uh, PSAP, and that's for fixed. If it's mobile VRS and IP relay, the CA would request your name and dispatchable location, connect to the designated PSAP, provide your telephone number, the name of the TRS, TRS provider, the CA's ID number, and deliver automatic dispatchable location if it's technically feasible. Otherwise, they would deliver your registered location. And in either of both cases, the CA would, if you, the CA, if you give the CA your uh, dispatchable location, you know, you know what your, what your address is, they will, they will give the best information they have to the PSAP. IPCTS is a little bit different because you aren't connected through the CA. The CA is only providing captions <coughs> of the other party's conversation. Also, the IPCTS provider may not be responsible for connecting the call to the PSAP. It may be your underlying telecom provider if, for example, the caption phone is simply connected to the home landline service. In that case, the requirements for the underlying provider, that is the telecom provider or VoIP provider, would, would apply. If the IPCTS is responsible for conducting the 911 call, then a fixed service <coughs> must connect to a designated PSAP, transmit the telephone number for callback, and deliver automatic dispatchable location. If it's a mobile service, it must <coughs> connect to the designated PSAP, transmit the telephone number, deliver automatic tech dispatchable location if it's technically feasible, feasible, otherwise registered location. What if I use a TTY? A TTY service must connect you to a PSAP, but the service is not required to transmit location information or a call number, just connect you. 
Rachel, if I can't make a voice call, can I text to 911? And can they find my location if I use text to 911? So text to 911 is currently available in many parts of the United States, but it's not available in all locations. The FCC encourages 911 call centers to begin accepting texts, but it's up to each state and 911 call center decide when to implement and deploy this technology. We estimate that about 65% of 911 call centers in the United States currently accept text messages. Covered text providers must provide automated dispatchable location with text to 911 if it is technically feasible for them to do so. Otherwise, end user manual provision of location information or enhanced location information, which may be coordinate based, consisting of the best available location that can be obtained from any available technology or combination of technologies at reasonable cost is required. Because RTT is an IP-based technology, the location information provided with the RTT session to 911 is as good as that provided with a voice call. Because SMS operates on legacy-style networks, the location that is provided may be less precise than that provided with a voice call or with RTT. <clears throat> Thank you. How do I know if text to 911 is available in my location? So we do encourage consumers to check with the state and local 911 authorities to determine whether text to 911 is available in their community. If a user attempts to send a text to 911 where the service is not yet available, the FCC rules do require wireless providers and other text messaging providers to send a, an automatic bounce back message that will advise the user to contact emergency services by another means such as by making a voice call or by using a telecommunications relay service. So there is another tool that I want to talk about. States and individual PSAPs can use a tool on the FCC's website called the Text to 911 Registry to alert covered text providers that their jurisdiction, jurisdiction is ready to accept text messages. Consumers can also use this registry to determine where, at a minimum, Text to 911 coverage is available in the United States with the caveat that more jurisdictions are offering the service than is reflected in the text to 911 registry. This is because PSAPs are not required to use the registry and may alternatively reach out to covered text providers directly to initiate text delivery. Because of its voluntary nature, the text to 911 registry does not show a full picture for consumers of where text to 911 service is available in the United States. We are also developing a map that shows the relative uptake of text to 911 at a state level using data collected from the annual 911 fee report. This data will show the number of PSAPs in a state that are text to 911 capable compared to the total number of PSAPs in the state. This data could be helpful for consumers to identify when a state is 100% text to 911 capable, meaning that a consumer can be confident that they can reach text to 911 from anywhere in the state. Based on our analysis so far, we can share that at a minimum, the following states and jurisdictions are 100% text to 911 capable. Arizona, California, Connecticut, Indiana, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, North Carolina, North Dakota, Rhode Island, Utah, <coughs> Vermont, Virginia, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. So I just want to add one other note about text to 911. <clears throat> the FCC requires RTT calls to be backward compatible with TTY. So if a PSAP has a TTY and can receive RTT calls on the TTY machine, then it's possible to have a conversation between the RTT user and the TTY service in the PSAP. However, the call will be a lot more like a TTY call, that is you'd be taking turns uh, when talking because the TTY does not have the same capabilities as RTT. So Bill, switching to another topic, does calling, does calling the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988 work the same way as calling 911? Well, it's not exactly the same. Currently, 988 calls are answered by the closest local crisis center, not a PSAP. 988 is operated by the U U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration and Vibrant Emotional Health. They have a network of over 200 crisis centers that answer 911 calls. So to make a 988 call, excuse me, 988 call, to make a 988 call, you can use landline or mobile phone, text, online chat, widgets at the, at the 988 Suicide and Crisis website, 
and direct video calling with a video phone or also a TTY. The Suicide and Crisis Lifeline states that calls are sent to the closest crisis center based on the area code of the calling number. And the crisis centers can connect a caller with a 911 call center in appropriate circumstances. So Rachel, last week the FCC adopted a 911 order at its open meeting. How does that order affect consumers? So we're happy to share some information on some of the commission's recent efforts to improve 911 service. We'll start with location-based routing. Location-based routing is the use of precise information about the location of the calling device to determine the destination PSAP for a call. This is an improvement over legacy 911 call routing, which routes calls to 911 based on the location of the cell tower that first picks up the call. Earlier this month, the Commission adopted a report and order with rules to require CMRS providers, wireless providers, to deploy and use location-based routing technology to route wireless 911 voice calls and RTT communications to 911 on their IP-based networks. The Commission estimates that this action will ensure that millions more 911 calls are routed to the correct 911 call center. Next, turning to next generation 911, last year the Commission proposed steps to advance the nationwide transition to next generation 911, also NG911. With the transition to NG911, IP based technologies will provide new capabilities and improved interoperability and system resilience. Some states report that they are experiencing delays in providers connecting to these IP based networks. The Commission has proposed to require providers to complete all translation and routing and to cover the costs to deliver 911 calls and texts, including associated location information in the requested IP-based format to points designated by a 911 authority. These actions are intended to enable 911 authorities to more quickly and effectively transition to next generation 911. Thank you, Rachel. Um, <clears throat> if we have time, we have, can open the floor for questions. If you have questions, don't forget to raise your tent and place it vertically on the table. We have Brianne. Uh, yeah, Brianne, you're recognized. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Brianne Berger from the U.S. Department of Education. And my question to you, could you elaborate on the process for filing complaints, specifically about text to 911? Uh, because in 2023, uh, just that one year alone, uh, I'm aware of uh, an area, areas around the country in which, you know, they stated that they had text 911 capabilities available, that they were fully implemented and operational. However, it failed to work uh, in those particular areas. So can you clarify the process about filing complaints when text 911 does not actually work? Um, uh, because there is some, oh, excuse me, uh, can I add just one more thing? The consumers uh, were told they had to file with the DOJ, the Department of Justice, so I'm not sure if you could maybe clarify the complaint process. Does that belong under this, with the state? Is it with the FCC or the DOJ? So briefly, um, <clears throat> the FCC does not have jurisdiction over PSAPs. PSAPs are under the jurisdiction of the DOJ and state and local authorities. So what, what, the, what, the, what the FCC can do is to require telecommunications carriers, relay service providers, and VoIP providers to carry text to 911, uh, but they can't necessarily make the PSAP receive it. So the, there is a process, which maybe Rachel, you want to talk about the process for um, in, initiating text to 911? Sure. So um, uh, in terms of having a, a provider initiate a request, or, so if, if there's a PSAP that has initiated text to 911 capability, they have two options. They can either contact the, the originating service provider directly to initiate that service, <coughs> or they can use the commission's text to 911 registry to initiate that service. Um, and so, and, and then within six months, they should have text to 911 service. Um, so, so it is a process that's initiated by the PSAP and, and with the, 
with the individual carriers. Um, <clears throat> in terms of filing a complaint, um, if you file a complaint with the Display Rights Office or through the FCC, uh, we can uh, review it and forward it to the appropriate person or make, make sure you can contact the appropriate person. I, I see. Okay, so for those who are consumer, those consumers that were told that they had to contact the DOJ to file a formal complaint uh, with the DOJ, I, I mean, personally, when I heard about those situations, and, and there were multiple uh, situations that I became aware of, when I heard about those, I was surprised that there was no direct contact to the FCC at all. You know, those consumers were never told to reach out to the FCC, they were told that they had to contact the DOJ. Um, so, I think that there must be some kind of uh, process that can take place for how both the FCC and the DOJ can be aware of the same situation. Susie? Thank you, Varianne, for that question. I would like to add to Rachel and Bill's comments, absolutely correct that they should reach out to the FCC if they have any concerns about accessibility of text to 911. We will support any contact, ensuring that they are able to obtain the assistance they need. Sometimes the Department of Justice is the appropriate location to reach out to due to the situation perhaps involving an ambulance going on site. In that situation, that's not within the FCC's jurisdiction. We have received text to 911 concerns in the past. We have worked closely with the parties, including public safety and others, to ensure that we do not receive those complaints again. But we are really trying to, it's not a public process. So we don't disclose, disclose when we receive complaints, and that perhaps may be why it's not well known, but we do receive these complaints, we do welcome them, and we do coordinate very closely with Department of Justice on those critical issues. I would like to add to your comment and question. Some people do reach out to us, letting us know that the map we have or the information contained within the registry is not accurate. Some of the information is perhaps missing, inaccurate, et cetera. We do always welcome people reaching out to us, as was previously mentioned. Perhaps you can help clarify as well the information in the text to 911 registry. Could you expand a bit on that? Sure. So the information that is in the current text to 911 registry is limited. It was a tool that it was developed for originating, ser er, for originating service providers and PSAPs to communicate with each other about um, when the PSAP is ready to initiate text to 911 <coughs> service. So they make the request using the text to 911 registry. The originating service provider hears that request, receives that valid request, and then within six months they begin to deliver text to that PSAP that has requested the service. However, because we don't regulate PSAPs, um, there are other ways for PSAPs to initiate service. So PSAPs can go ahead and reach out to originating service providers directly in order to begin receiving text to 911. So those instances are not reflected in the registry, um, but we can say that it, at a minimum, um, the places that are reflected in the registry do accept text to 911 service. Brianne here, I think there's a little bit of confusion between initiating and currently existing entities. So, oh, excuse me, I just wanna make sure the camera was on me now. So I'll repeat my, my comment. Um, oh, I think it was already said, sorry. But I wanted to wait for the camera to be on me. Um, in any case, so I, I know you've talked a lot about the initiating, so implementing text 911. I just wanna say my question is more about what is already currently existing. So just to clarify that point. See Karen uh, Strauss has a question. Thank you. I have a question and a comment, I guess, or the second's a question too, although I'm not sure you're going to be able to answer it. 
Um, Bill, I think that I, I, can you repeat what you said about TTYs? There's no requirement for location to be passed along from, TTY, uh, from TTYs. But that doesn't necessarily make sense because it's a voice transmission. It's not a data transmission. So that location has been passed along ever since TTYs had to be accessible or received by PSAPs. That's my first question. <coughs> so the, uh, the under the commission's rules, the TTY is required to connect. Uh, <coughs> The TTY service provider is required to connect to the PSAP, but they don't necessarily have to provide like automatic location or anything like that. They're going to provide to the PSAP what the TTY user is telling them. Okay, I I'm, I'm remain confused about that, and maybe I'll take it offline with you because it, it is the automatic location is passed along by the voice transmission. It's not. It's not again. It's not a data transmission. It's not like text. So that's the first time I've ever heard of that. Um, but the second question, again, it's kind of more of a comment, is um, as you know, uh, copper wiring is being replaced rapidly and real -time, the real-time text proceeding at the FCC only dealt with VoIP-enabled wireless technologies, not wireline. I realize that wireline is also diminishing rapidly, but um, just a general global question has, there are going to be still situations in emergencies where people need to access um, 911 in a situation where there isn't text. It was very, by the way, thank you so much for what you're doing. I should start with that. The FCC has been really doing a marvelous job at rolling out greater accessibility for 911. So thank you for that. But it's, there's still lots of gaps. So I'm wondering whether there's any movement at the commission to complete the, notice of, the further notice of proposed rulemaking rule on real-time text to close some of those gaps for wireline. I realize it's a hard question, but <coughs> um, let me out. maybe we can clarify one thing. If if the TTY user has a landline connection, the underlying it's not the TTY provider right. service that's providing the location. It's the underlying landline provider. Yes, and that's the way it's worked. It's yeah. the underlying provider that passes along. It's right. not the TTY right. provider's responsibility. Right. On the first question. Yep. Um, and on RTT, we have a pending NPRM, um, and I, I don't have any further information on it right now. But um, uh, there is the uh, there was a, <coughs> a notice of proposed rulemaking on NG911, which is still also pending. So there, there, last year there was a, a proposed rules um, on next generation 911 to help help with that transition to IP-based technologies. And that will Thank require um, service providers to deliver IP-based calls to 911, right? That's right. One last chance, any other questions for Bill or Rachel? Thank you for the, oh, yes. There is a comment. Okay, Tom, then the camera gets to you. Thanks, hi, Tom from Comcast, NBC Universal. Could, I, I don't think I caught one of the uh, references you made to uh, last week's order. Could you, could you clarify what that was versus the, you know, uh, you said information at the device level versus cell tower. Can you, can you clarify that a little bit? Just, I needed a little bit more context there. Sure, so that's the location-based routing for wireless 911 calls report and order. Um, and the commission adopted rules in that order to improve the location information that wireless carriers are using to route 911 wireless voice calls and RTT communications to 911. So previously, um, carriers were using the location of the cell tower that first picks up the call in order to route, determine the appropriate PSAP to route those calls to. Um, the report and order would require um, wireless providers in certain situations to use um, the very precise location information that's available about where the device is. Um, generally, that location information is available from the device um, to route calls to 911. So we're really thinking about improving the resolution of the location information that's being used for routing calls. All right, 
Anyone else? Okay. Go ahead. Catherine. Uh, so my name is Kate Elkins, and I'm at NHTSA's National 911 program, and I just want to applaud the FCC for the uh, more accurate location rule because I think this is incredibly critical. I'm still an active 911 response paramedic. Um, being able to locate your actual location with this more precise location data is going to be very important. Um, and then I just wanted to say that uh, everyone is challenged at times in some of our 911 centers that there's a lot of diversity across states and communities with the technology in the 911 centers that can challenge the um, ability to have some of these um, adaptive technologies. And so it's really important you might have one 911 center next to another and one might be able to receive text and one might not. So this location information can be incredibly valuable to making sure you're reaching that right 911 center and whatever technology they have. Thank you for that comment. That's really important. Anyone else? All right. I want to thank um, Bill and Rachel for their presentation. Incredibly informative, and uh, I'm sure there'll be more on this. We we need to we need to stay on top of this. This is crucial for people's safety. So thank you so much. All right. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right, next um, we're going to hear from Annie Yurosky, who is the chair of the Best Practices for Quality Telecommunications Relay Services for Individuals with Multiple Disabilities Working Group. That's almost as much as Tom's group, as far as <laughs> words go. <laughs> and she will be giving us an update on what the working group has been charged with in identifying opportunities and challenges and developing the best practices for telecommunications and relay services for people with multiple disabilities. So thank you, Annie. Great, thank you. This is Annie signing. I am going to try to keep this short. Uh, so first, I want to thank all of you for the opportunity in asking the TRS Best Practices Working Group to present today at the DAC. We want to take some time to review briefly what our working group has been doing and what we've been tasked with. We have identified opportunities as well as challenges and developed some best practices for people who are eligible for TRS services, emphasizing people who have speech disabilities or who are deaf or deaf blind or de hard of hearing. Also other disabilities, for example, any cognitive movement disabilities or any other disabilities possible. And we are trying to improve the quality for people who have multiple disabilities. Our working group has been involved with a report and order for quite some time now for communication accessibility issues, as well as involving various stakeholders. Our process started, uh, our working group initially got together and we started discussing the current, the current scope and identifying the scope that we were trying to work on and focus on various areas. We then started brainstorming possible presenters that we could bring in and we had a range from the current TRS providers as well as key stakeholders and key organizations and various representatives of consumers who had multiple disabilities as well. We invited them to come and present at our current working group meeting and to give us an in-depth oversight about their experiences as well as their knowledge and provide consumers who use TRS services or identify current challenges for consumers who may qualify for TRS services as well as identifying any opportunities where we could use specific examples. So those are some examples that may include consumer experience, as well as testimonials, data, research, program services, any identified barriers. 
and resolving those barriers. One thing I want to emphasize is that our working group has been acknowledging the intersectionality of the disability community. And we really want to emphasize and highlight that TRS consumers have various challenges and experience and opportunities for those individuals. It's not a one-size-fits-all experience for consumers. So some of our solutions that we propose is to spend time reviewing the concepts and the functions of what it means to be functionally equivalent, as well as best practice and standards. For example, the current FCC mandatory minimum standards, MMS, and sharing the type of various relay services and consumers with additional disabilities. So their experiences are very diverse and have a broad range, and so it's important that we consider that in our development of our report moving forward. As of right now, the draft wor working group has drafted a report, and we have expanded to include various information from our previous meetings. Our next work moving forward, we are going to continue meeting, and we're also going to bring in some additional presenters that we haven't heard from yet. We want them to provide additional in-depth information for our report. In the meantime, uh, keep an eye out for our draft report, which will be in spring of 2024. Thank you. Do you want to ask if yeah. they have any questions? Absolutely, please, any questions? All right, we'll be looking forward to your next update, Ani, and your group, thank you. All right, our next um, presentation will be from Shadi Abu Zara, um, who is chair of the best practices on the use of artificial intelligence for captioning programming um, working group. Um, and they are working on the on recommendations and best practices on the use of automatic speech recognition and other AI-based technologies as they apply to covered live or near live video programming. So Shadi, thank you for your group, your presentation and your group's work up to this point. Um, as always, a very interesting topic that we all want to learn more about, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, um, my name is Shadi Abuzara. I represent Amazon, and I'm chairing this working group with a very long title um, <laughs> as well. Um, this is one of the newer working groups, so we've uh, recent, only recently really started to uh, meet more um, regularly. And, and uh, Ex Excuse me, Shadi. I'm going to interrupt you. Uh, we have uh, Commissioner uh, Anna Gomez, who's joined us, and I'll give her an opportunity to make remarks uh, to the group. Thank you, Commissioner Gomez. I didn't mean to interrupt anything, and in fact, I was kind of looking forward to hearing the AI piece, so, uh, but I'm happy to give remarks now. <laughs> um, as soon as I get them out. So uh, thank you to uh, CGB Chief Rourke and to your ABLE co-chairs um, for the kind invitation to join the DAC and to introduce myself to this important group. I just want to look around the table while I can. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for uh, your service to this important advisory committee, your expertise your experiences and your advocacy as leaders for accessibility and communication are critical assets to the commission and to the public. And it's a pleasure to see you all, especially those people I already know. <laughs> as you might know, I'm the newest commissioner here at the FCC. I'm sorry I wasn't able to come earlier. I was at a different event. Um, and I've been on the job for four months. And in that short amount of time, I have learned a lot and am finessing my take on our agency's work. 
As commissioner, I am focused on how technological innovation can benefit all consumers for economic prosperity and security. This means connectivity, ensuring everyone, everywhere, has access to reliable, high-speed connectivity and broadband internet access. Innovation, ensuring that we have the spectrum necessary to meet the thirst for innovation and that we maintain U.S. leadership. Public safety, ensuring that first responders have what they need to do their job, as well as making sure that communities have what they need to receive essential emergency information, which we just talked about. And media, ensuring that we are protecting localism and fostering a vibrant media ecosystem. In each of these areas, I want to make sure that we are taking everyone with us. I want to ensure that all consumers are served by the FCC's actions, especially those that have historically been left behind. The commitment to all undoubtedly includes serving people with disabilities. The disability community faces spe specific technology challenges to which we are entrusted to pay attention and to address. The disability community also brings rich and innovative experiences and perspectives to every aspect of the work of our agency. For example, at the recent Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, I saw a smart TV that has an ASL display. And consumers can adjust the font and the placement of the display to meet their needs. And there were many other accessibility things that we saw. I just can't list them all or they'll kick me out. <laughs> now we can harness this creativity and the solutions that the disability community brings to our communications for the benefit of all consumers. Now I mentioned that I'm learning. One of the ways in which I learn is by hosting cafecitos. Cafecito is a common term in Colombia where I grew up to describe basically getting together with your friends for coffee and having a conversation. My office hosts cafecitos to build relationships with organizations representing historically underserved communities and to learn about the telecommunications and media issues that matter to them. I would love to hold a cafecito for the disability community this year. And please know that my door is always open to you. I look forward to building a relationship with each of you and collaborating with you to support the millions of persons with disabilities in our country so that they have access to communications. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Commissioner Gomez, for, um, for those remarks. And uh, I hope you will be able to stay and hear some of the preliminary report from our working group on AI. Thank you, Chair Carlson, and yes. Thank you. Um, so back to Shadi now to pick up on your report. Yes, thank you very much. I was just uh, explaining that this is, um, uh, we've just recently started with this uh, group, and so um, we uh, have been um, having uh, presentations from different stakeholders uh, we've had one so far, we're actually having a second this afternoon. We're having a face-to-face -face meeting this afternoon. Um, and um, I mean, my personal take is um, not uh, if, um, or, or it's, it's how to leverage, um, you know, the, the immense capabilities of AI uh, to improve um, the availability of captions in particular for um, uh, for live and near live um, is, is the context of this particular working group here. Um, so we're really looking at, at foundational work here in, in terms of how can we improve the best practices that already exist uh, to make them more technology neutral. Um, here and there we know they, they do uh, refer to human captioners. Um, so far, I have the feeling that there will be some recommendations that can be very specific uh, that we can make, um, um, maybe even agree on suggested wording to recommend uh, to, to the commission, um, you know, um, to, to edit particular areas. Other um, areas might be wider, might be bigger, 
where we might not have, uh, you know, uh, as specific, but where we can, we want to be as specific as possible uh, in our recommendations resulting from this work. We do have an outline of the deliverable, um, thanks to uh, work from uh, a lot of the participants, in particular Kyle and Heather and uh, Darlene. I uh, want to mention that it's, it's their uh, background that they've provided that uh, made it possible to have this outline. So we kind of have a, a North Star, a, a direction of where we think uh, the deliverable um, will be, uh, will look like uh, the final deliverable, but it does need to be fleshed out, uh, and that's <laughs> probably the, the biggest part of the work. Um, we do hope, we have a very aggressive timeline, and we do hope to have um, at least a mature draft uh, by uh, the, the next uh, DAC meeting um, later this year um, in, 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 in the summer or in the um, second quarter sometime. Um, so um, this is as much as I have right now. Um, as I said, we're still um, getting the, the, the work started, uh, but if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to hear. Sounds like we're going to be anxiously waiting for more details at our next DAC <laughs> meeting. So thank you, Shadi, and your working group for, um, for this very interesting and important work. All right, I'm going to, um, I believe, recognize Josh next to um, cover uh, housekeeping and also our public participation portion of the meeting. Hi, this is Josh Mendelson, designated federal officer for the DAC. And this portion is where we welcome questions, either from the audience that is present here in person, also via email, to the address livequestions at FCC.gov. First, I would like to check in with the in-person audience to see if anybody in the room would like to come up and ask a question or make any comments. There is a microphone on the left side of the room if you're looking at me at the dais. So on the left side, there is a microphone available for your use. So I'd like to just take a moment now to see if anybody in the audience would like to ask a question or make a comment. Yes, we have one. Can you please identify yourself with your name and then go ahead and ask your question or make your comment? Yes, I, I first wanna say thank you for inviting the public to this meeting today. Um, I am a NOMA resident, and my name is Melanie Jones. Uh, my first comment, I guess, would be that I am completing a master's degree in IT, and I have moved around to a few universities in, um, in an effort to find an ideal program. And what I do find that is lacking, and maybe this is something that the Department of Education uh, should make special note of, is that within curriculums and coursework, there is little attention paid to the needs of the ADA community. Um, and curriculums need to be developed in learning uh, centers where IT professionals are being developed that pay special attention to the need for technology that serves um, the community, um, the American disability community. Um, as well, um, my other question uh, was pertaining to the 911 and 988 um, working group, and I'm not sure if they are still here. Um, but I suppose it could also go to someone from Amazon who I believe just spoke as well. With regards to smart home technology, uh, such as Google services and Alexa, I'm just wondering why um, perhaps the 
FCC has not strongly encouraged um, companies like this to automatically include um, technology um, devices that would uh, pretty much, I, I think, um, support this direct access to 988 and 911. And then finally, it occurred to me that just like everyone carries around a device, um, uh, everyone has their smartphone, and this has become something that is like an appendage for most people, uh, are we encouraging technology? Because it just seems to me that uh, the needs of the ADA community really, really do test true creativity and technology. And if you are a true innovator, then creating products that serve people who um, have special needs would be something that would be the real challenge in terms of your creativity. Um, there need to be handheld devices for individuals that um, address these individual needs um, in terms of whatever smart technology uh, an individual with a disability may have. And what are we doing in the technology community to create uh, such a device or such um, uh, innovation for people with disabilities? Thank you. Susie, please go ahead. Uh, and Zachary as well. Thank you. Um, this is Zachary. I'll just wait for the camera. Over here. Over here. Over here. Other side of the room. There we are. Thank you. Um, this is Zachary Bastian um, from Verizon Communications. Excellent set of questions, excellent set of points. I just wanted to respond to the first one, uh, specifically that um, education around accessibility um, and disability access is lacking, and um, this specific problem is something that is being worked on uh, by a program called Teach Access that really works at getting more accessible-oriented education in engineering programs, uh, specifically at the university level around the country. Uh, really building in that systemic understanding of how uh, fundamental accessibility is to a lot of these problems and the fact that, um, particularly from an engineering perspective, uh, making products more accessible makes them more usable for everybody, not just for people with disabilities. So um, I will be around after the meeting if you'd like to talk about Teach Access. I'd love to share some more information about that program that is uh, addressing that specific issue that you spoke about. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Lindsay, you're recognized. Um, I just wanted to expand on her second point. I was actually going back and forth in my head after the 911-988 presentation, but the second piece about um, considering the use of smart technologies, particularly smart displays or smart speakers for access to 911 services. Um, I know that most of these devices are typically very clear in stating when they can, the limitations to which they can or cannot be utilized to access 911. Um, and in the past year or so, there has been some expansion of major telecommunications carriers um, enabling number sharing or pairing of your mobile wireless services to these devices, but from a access point in an emergency um, <clears throat> throughout our research labs projects, um, in my personal experience as an occupational therapist, um, and from um, <clears throat> what we've learned, there's a lot of instances in which um, <clears throat> If you don't have your phone near you, this is something where you can call out from anywhere in your home um, and potentially um, initiate that sequence. And if you're fallen and on the floor, um, I bet we've all heard at some point or another of an instance of an older adult who's fallen. And if you can't access another device, um, it's really essential. Also, just um, in a lot of our clients with disabilities experiences, um, some with complex motor impairments that <clears throat> um, they can't even use a personal emergency response button because they either do not have the dexterity 
um, to control that device or due to maybe irregular movements can, um, <clears throat> like spasticity or whatnot, will accidentally um, initiate those devices. So in turn, they will not wear them. And there's not a good reliable set of um, hands-free telecommunications um, initiation sequences. So I guess just really um, considering the role of those smart speakers and devices um, in that sequence and any protocols in relation to it because there's a lot of examples um, and especially healthcare providers could probably provide <laughs> copious amounts of example to this of instances where that lack of access to a device um, has initiated, has delayed a response initiation in an emergency. Uh, Kate with the Department of uh, Transportation. So uh, I'm with the National 911 program in the Office of Emergency Medical Services at NHTSA. And uh, excellent points by the two who answered before and excellent questions. Um, I think I need to wait for the camera. Is it? There we go. All right. Um, I think it's, so I'm still a 911 response paramedic and I can say that there are times when people have not been able to notify um, and times when notifications have happened when they didn't intend them to and it's important for all of our technology to be more innovative and more adaptive. Um, I think one thing that's important to flag, I answer all the public emails for 911.gov. Um, the number of times I get emailed people trying to figure out how to contact 911 because they're in a household that has one cell phone and that cell phone has gone to work with the parents or with other family members, even if we pair these speakers and other devices and, and smart home technology to a cell phone, if you are an underserved community member who only has one cell phone per family and that cell phone has left the building and is somewhere else, we now have a challenge with reaching 911. And with children taking home tablets and laptops through school systems, we actually saw an uptick of them attempting to reach 911 by email because they didn't have anything installed on the device or a cell or telephone line connection or a Wi-Fi connection for that device. So I think our, our federal partners are having great discussions to really improve making sure we, we catch all these pitfalls where there are spaces where this technology could be an innovative solution, but we need to make sure that those gaps are filled for the cell or Wi-Fi or VoIP or whatever methodology to connect them reliably um, to those services. And don't forget, the 911 center has to have the technology to be able to receive it. So if we have requirements in place, but we have not funded our local or state level 911 systems in order to implement that technology, and we know next generation technology is gonna take significant funding, um, then that is a challenge where we might be able to deliver it part way, but they have to be able to receive it. And as a paramedic in the field, I want to not have those missed opportunities to improve outcomes. It's to be recognized, but just before we do, Lindsay, did you have a response to Kate? I, she brought up one other point I forgot. So from a socioeconomic standpoint, I have copious amounts of examples that also fall within that space of one cellular plan for a household and maybe they also have an internet plan. So rather than requiring multiple people in this household to have cellular plans and internet access, um, if you have those two means and the person is just trying to reach 911 from that home, um, especially if they are a person with a disability um, that's by themselves. Um, it's also a socioeconomic way to increase access um, by enabling different routes um, than just uh, the traditional. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Karen? Thank you. Um, so thanks for your question. You mentioned the ADA a lot, but um, you may not be aware that there are other laws that are very specific to technology including the communications, and I have to always read this even though I helped write it, the Communications and Video Programming Accessibility Act, the CVAA, which requires cell phones, laptops, and other digital devices to generally be accessible with respect to communications, internet and digital communications, as well as ensuring that people who are blind or low vision are able to access websites. So you may want to look into that act. Um, the FCC has issued umpteen numbers of, um, of rules to implement it. So there are actually requirements in place to 
require cell phones to be accessible to people with disabilities, again, with respect to their digital communications. Also, you may be interested in knowing that there is pending legislation. You knew that I couldn't help but mention this today. Um, the CVTA, which is the Communications Video and Technology Accessibility Act, um, that will fill gaps in the CVA. The CVA was enacted in 2010. Actually, the industry has done a marvelous job at implementing it, and many industry, many companies have their own built-in accessibility teams, um, and cell phones and other mobile and digital devices are far more accessible than they were without that law, but there are some gaps, and so the CVTA, the, the second act that I mentioned, which was introduced by um, in the Senate and the House, is now pending to fill in those gaps. If you'd like more information, I'd be happy to talk to you separately. Shadi? Yes, uh, Shadi Abuzara from, from Amazon. Um, um, I, I, I just want to echo what several have said and, and uh, you know, great set of questions and I think really, really important topic as a person with mobility disability myself, um, I, I, I think this is uh, extremely important and something that we uh, look at very carefully and we continue to expand. Uh, but I, I think also Karen's point on reflecting the, the complexity of uh, different um, regulations in this area um, is also um, relates to the complexity of the situation itself. It's, it's not just the, the device itself and the user interface of the device, but, but then also the, the co connectivity um, and the um, response centers and how equipped they are. And, and, um, and so it goes through multiple um, stakeholders and actors that um, to work together to ensure this end-to-end um, -end, um, availability uh, of, of, of such services. Uh, so this is just, just what I wanted to highlight, but um, just echo that this is a very important area um, um, that we continually um, work to, to expand on. Thank you to the person who just asked questions and sparked this great discussion. We want to ensure emergency access for people with disabilities. Now we do have one question that came in via email through that live questions at FCC.gov address. And so I'd like to read it out here. In summary, the question is asking, or really it's a comment, that when a person makes a phone call to 911, the PSAP sometimes asks, can you make a voice call? And this person recommends that the PSAP stop asking that question, they cease asking that question. And the comment further says that it is crucial to raise public awareness of when and how to call 911 using various methods, including voice and text messaging, as well as SMS, short messaging services, or real-time text, RTT, as well as other communication modalities. In addition, Education should also include when not to call 911 to reduce the number of unnecessary calls to 911 centers to save lives. This education campaign is critical and a better to assist people in a time of crisis to preserve life, health, and safety of residents especially individuals with disabilities and older adults and victims of domestic violence or persons 
that are incarcerated or in an active shooter situation. This aspect of education, SMS is available to be able to contact 911 for individuals that are deaf, deaf blind, hard of hearing, or have a speech disability, as well as individuals who may be in a domestic violent or hostage situation or active shooter situation where a voice to 911 call may put them in a dangerous situation. My recommendation is that 911 centers need to cease asking this question, can you make a voice call in those situations? I'm now gonna turn it over to Susie Rosen Singleton, who will go ahead and respond to this comment. This is Susie Rosen Singleton speaking. Thank you, Josh, for reading that question and comment. Uh, this was from Richard Ray, who unfortunately was unable to be with us today. He is in California at the moment and very well versed on 911, emergency communications. As you may know, he served on the emergency access co advisory committee that we had here at the FCC many years ago. In addition to that, we have many reports that have come as a result of the work the EAC has done. So in talking about next steps to ensure emergency communications are accessible, which includes text 911, he was very heavily involved in all of that work. Thank you, Richard, for that. Now to his comment about the steps. He has asked when making a voice call, they're already using a different methodology to use n to call 911 in this situation. Please let us know if that is happening. We would like to hear more about that. We would like to understand better why that is occurring. We have received that complaint in the past. We have worked with that PSAP to ensure that concern has been resolved. So we do welcome your outreach. If you have any feedback to share with us or have received any such from your PSAPs, please do share that with us. It's dro at fcc.gov. You can email us there. We also have an ASL line. We have a voice line. And all of those options are available. Hmm, I was hoping I would have it here with me. Hmm. I do not have the phone number in front of me and unfortunately don't have the greatest memory. As Albert Einstein said, why memorize numbers if they're in the phone book, right? Uh, <laughs> but fcc.gov slash accessibility. All of the contact information is listed there. Please, if you receive that feedback from your PSAPs, please do share that with us. Voice calls are generally better. That's what text to 911 staff typically share. They say, if possible, please do use your voice for emergency calls, and if not, use other methods. And you will receive a bounce back method if you cannot text. Oh, and Josh is showing me the phone number. Voice phone number is 202-418-2517. ASL line is 844-432. 2275. And again, email address is dro at fcc.gov. Now we do encourage you to file those online through our complaint system. It's just fcc.gov slash accessibility complaint. Accessibility complaint form. And again, all of that information is available on our website. Thank you, Richard, for that. This is Josh Mendelson, again. You should notice that there was a phone ringing in one part of the room, uh, and that was not via this phone number. <laughs> yeah. We also received a comment saying that the live stream audio is very quiet. And so it's very difficult to be able to hear via the live stream. So we've recognized that and we are making that a note for an area of improvement for the future. And we actually did just receive another live question. 
just give me one moment, please. You want me to read it? Yes, please. OK. So this question is asking, Are intellectual and developmental disabled people being represented in the multiple disability working group discussion? Annie, would you like to respond to that question? I'd like to go ahead and recognize Annie Yuraski. She'll go ahead and take that question, whether intellectual and developmental disability concerns are being represented and incorporated into that work group. This is Annie signing here. That is a great question. So based on the scope, and we do have to focus on individuals who are eligible for TRS services, uh, so who have additional disabilities that could possibly uh, be incorporate presenters from those communities. I think that's a critical, critical aspect to explore. So if they qualify for T TRS services, then we'd love to incorporate them in our discussion. I would have to check the roster to make sure that we are also within the consumer organizations or advocacy-based advocacy, advocacy -based organizations that represent those, those individuals. So. This is Josh. This is Josh. Thank you for that response. Annie is the chair of the TRS Best Practices Working Group. Oh, we really need to work on those working group names. We actually just received another question. And this one has to do with 911 and nonverbal means. If a person contacts 911 using nonverbal means and they're successful in connecting, why are the operators being ensured that the consumer receives the emergency response? For example, maybe signs ASL. And is a consumer of Ireland and experiences a seizure and has deafness and has called 911 for them. But none of the first responders signed ASL, so that led to a lot of miscommunication. Susie Rosen Singleton. We'll go ahead and take this question. Hi, this is Susie Rosen Singleton speaking. I'd like to ensure I understand the question correctly. Unfortunately, we received this question through email and are unable to ask for clarification. There was successful connection with the 911 and someone was dispatched to that particular location. The person who was present at the location was unable to communicate. And that situation is where the FCC's role ends and the DOJ's begins, where you have accessible communications on site. This is where we do not have rules requiring effective communication on site. That being said, it's an emergency. I'm sure that the staff would be trained to communicate in different ways. For example, in Washington, D.C., my understanding is that there are some police stations in the district that have charts with images, and they will point at images so that way they can communicate as best they can in the situation. I'm sure there are various other methods or if people have, oh, I couldn't see behind the interpreters. Great, please do add. Kate. So I'm over here for the camera. Um, <laughs> um, 
So again, my name is Kate Elkins, and I work in NHTSA's Office of Emergency Medical Services in the National 911 system or program. So EMS and 911 systems are regulated at the local and the state level. So there is not federal regulation of these aspects of emergency medical services. That being said, my office, um, in terms of sort of the global services. DOJ obviously is gonna regulate the, the disability access. Um, in terms of, it's gonna vary locally what resources those emergency medical providers and first responders have. There is a lot of leveraging technology for helping with interpretation and, and now some technology for video um, interpretation on scene. Where I practice as a paramedic, I don't have that. Um, one thing that my office does help with is we put out the educational standards for EMS clinicians, and I will make sure to take this back as we do any revisions of their educational standards. Um, we also are working on some educational projects related to 911. I think it's really important to be an advocate in your community and in your state to help at the local level and the state level where they have more ability to implement technology and education for these first responders. We want to be able to communicate fast and accurately with every single patient. This is Josh Mendelson. This concludes our public participation period. And I am really pleased with the number of questions and comments and the involvement of our membership with the responses to those questions. So thank you to everyone. I'd now like to turn it over to Kim, who is going to start concluding this meeting. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I just want to echo what you said. I think the richness and the information shared during the public comment period was exceptional. My first DAC meeting, there was silence. So this is, this is really exciting to me that the public did engage with us and the sharing around this meeting table today was really um, informative and I think will generate a lot more activity. So thank you to everyone for your participation. Um, it's been a pleasure for me to co-chair today and I'm gonna hand off the final um, Conclusion to my co-chair, Kyle. Thanks, Kim. Uh, I, I say it often, and I'll say it again. Uh, it is reassuring that we can come together here in Washington where things are often so divided that, uh, and we can come together with such diverse perspectives and really get something done, both for these specific communities, but also for the public generally. So. Thank you for your time, your expertise, your enthusiasm, and of course, uh, thanks again to the mighty FCC staff uh, that works with us. Um, and my concluding thing will be to announce that our next DAC meeting will be in person on May 16th, 2024 at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. That's May 16th, 2024 at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. The meeting is adjourned.